Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we are now moving on to the second presentation of the day. And again, I'd like to thank Patrick Lucy from Aquatex in Canada. Um, at the close of my session in, on the brief history of sanitation, I think I left you with the, this screenshot and its contrast with how many communities in the developing world are having to face some very serious water and sanitation issues. And I thought it was worthwhile starting this session reminding ourselves of how fragile our existence are, is we are and how we really are sitting at the what's called the Goldilocks point in the universe. We are this fragile little blue dot in space, this little speck of insignificant dust sitting just at the right place not to be frozen to death because we're too far from the sun or uh, being fried because we're too close. And I think this, this image really puts in perspective how we need to rethink how we're going to preserve these resources for the future. And so at this point, uh, Patrick, I would like to pass this off to you and I'm going to mute my microphone and my uh, audio and video. Well, good morning. I'm going to just engage in screen share and see what we get here. And you're just fine, Patrick. Go right ahead. Good. Thank you, Dendra. Um, my name is Patrick Lucy. I'm uh, a senior aquatic ecologist with a small boutique consulting company uh, headquartered in Victoria, British Columbia, uh, Canada. And what I would like to begin with is a presentation that lays out, following Dendra's uh, talk earlier, how I see as, as an ecologist and someone who works directly with the development community um, the nature of a problem that has been building for actually millennia and that has essentially come to a head uh, as we begin the 21st century. And I will walk you through in more detail the nature of what I consider to be the problem and then in two subsequent sessions I'm going to walk you through how we have used a design with nature or a biomimicry approach to fairly straightforward urban design and agricultural practices um, and large-scale watershed management that regenerates what we call ecosystem function or ecosystem health. Essentially um, what I'm talking about is generating value, not just economic value but social capital, social equity value, and ecological value using what we call engineered ecology and I'll come back to that later. So essentially this is urban design that functions like a forest. If we look at the 20th century coming out of the late 1800s we began to see a series of very substantial global challenges that faced all of us and Dendro's given us an excellent introduction to the first which of course was waterborne disease and much of that uh, pathology was linked to the fact that the human wastes and our industrial wastes came out of pipes into our receiving environments typically freshwater environments that led to the ocean and immediately upstream and downstream of those discharges were the intakes for our water supply. We were also contaminating much of our groundwater and so groundwater sources were also contaminated and of course probably the most iconically famous is the Broad Street Pump from the 1860s, late 1850s and John Snow's discovery of what was causing uh, widespread disease as a result of contaminated water. After the First World War um, we saw a decade of economic collapse uh, which affected much of the world and that was then followed by the Second World War and in the 50s and 60s we underwent a green agricultural revolution where we changed many of our tillage practices, we looked at reducing 
at least to some extent, the loss of soil through poor agricultural um, forage crop production, and we began to apply very substantial science and technology to the production of food. And of course, that process has continued um, <clears throat> on into the 21st century. In the early 1970s and 1980s, there was less an energy crunch than an oil crunch because the first century um, global development was largely based on the production and ready access of uh, almost what seemed to be unlimited supplies of petrochemical energy at prices that uh, drove our economy. And here we are in the first decade of the 21st century and the oil issue, uh, that is the energy and petrochemical issue, has been replaced with fresh water. It has been said um, that fresh water is the new oil. If we continue on into the second half, or the first half rather, of the 21st century, I will postulate that wildlife or ecosystem services, that is the natural capital of the planet, both terrestrial and marine, um, and of course by that I mean aquatic, so freshwater and marine as well as terrestrial, are going to be the next major stumbling block and our expectation in terms of the group that I represent is originally we thought that might be 2050, we're thinking now that the real issue is going to start hitting us around 2020 and in fact we're already seeing signs of that now, it's, it's actually now measurable. The last item on this graph is tame life and by tame life we simply mean those species that we control some or all of their life cycle. So whether it's the complete control of a microbe like a, a fungi or a bacteria in a pharmaceutical uh, production facility or corn or wheat or rice or animals, cows, pigs, uh, and aquaculture of course, um, which is where we currently drive most of our nutritional um, needs from is going to be the real issue as we try to feed a new two billion mouths uh, that are projected to be added to the population by roughly 2045. So this is just a snapshot of the kinds of issues that we've grappled with in the 20th century and that we now think we're going to be facing in the 21st century. The key of course from our perspective as ecologists is that line that rises from left to right is a linear line of a series of almost endless crises that the planet has had to grapple with and I would suggest and I'm going to spend the next three sessions arguing it's all because because of an ancient design issue and that design issue is a legacy of the Roman Empire. So if we think about the key issue um, on the planet and it is the blue planet that is all life as we know it is fundamentally based on water, whether it's fresh or aqua uh, marine, it's still fundamentally H2O. So if we look at the total supply of water on the planet as represented by the large diagram here on the right, that blue portion is the total percentage of the water on the planet that is salt water. The white circle represents all of the fresh water and of course that water is in the form of ice, groundwater, vapor, and fresh water on the planet, liquid fresh water. Of that total volume of fresh water, that little black dot represents the available fresh water for all life on the terrestrial portion of the planet. If we take that little tiny black dot, and divide it into roughly four equal parts, one quarter, this is an approximation, but approximately one quarter is found in Lake Baikal in southeastern uh, Siberia. A second quarter of that fresh water, somewhere between 20 and 25 percent, is the amount of water found in Canada in all of our lakes, wetlands, and rivers. That means that 50% of the total volume of liquid fresh water available on the planet for human needs, let alone any other species needs, is found in two countries and the 
individuals around Lake Baikal in Canada represent less than 40 million people. That means the other roughly 7 billion people have to make do with the other 50% of the total fresh water on the planet. So if we go back in time um, to a Roman period about 2700 years ago, what we find is that the Romans very carefully laid out the two principal criteria that are essential for building a city, a town or a city. And the first is fresh water and the upper image shows two examples of Roman aqueducts. Many of these are still in place and still functioning and have been doing so for well in excess of two millennia. So you need to bring clean, safe, abundant supplies of drinking water into our areas for agriculture and for our cities. You then need to take the wastes away from those cities and we generally have done that as Dendra showed by developing a system of wastewater discharge facilities. The second item that the Romans truly understood was essential to build towns and cities of course are roads. And the roads must be all weather, all season roads. So whatever demand is placed on the road in terms of transporting goods, people or military uh, apparatus, the road needs to be usable 24-7, 365. And the bottom image is an example of a road in um, Italy and you can see the ancient remains from literally a couple of thousand years ago and in the background where the red arrow is showing is a complex of modern high-rises. So here we have a road that has been used or has been and is usable for literally a couple of thousand years and we can see the two different types of building structures. The next image is a pair of superimposable images of the city of Vancouver, British Columbia on the west coast of Canada, just a couple of hours north of Seattle, Washington. And the first image in the up, upper portion is one taken in 1900. The global population, um, uh, sorry, the image is 1910, and in about 1900 the estimate is the world population was 1 billion. The second image is taken 100 years later, in 2010, the global population is 7 billion and the estimate is if we come back in 2045, the global population will have increased by another 2 billion. The difference being that in 1910, the majority of people did not live in cities or towns, they lived in the countryside. In 2014, three quarters of the world's population now lives in cities and in 2045, that extra two billion is anticipated almost all will live in cities and none of those cities are in existence today. They are going to need to be built over the next 20 or 30 years and every city will require water, energy, food, transportation, communication and all of that will place increasing stress on the ecosystem services, the natural capital of the planet. If we look at this image between 1910 and 2010, what we notice is how different the two landscapes look. What changed between 1910 and 2010 was the advent of structural steel to be used in reinforced concrete and in the steel armature of skyscrapers or very tall buildings and the advent of electric motors. Very few electric motors were in use in 1910 and you'll notice almost a complete absence of vehicles, that is automobiles in those images. Horses were still a, uh, an important mode of transportation as was public transit a uh, hundred years ago. In order to build the modern city today, what we need are electric motors. And one of the key uses for those electric motors is for moving water around. Both liquid water for drinking and water for irrigation and of course within our wastewater treatment facilities. So if we move to the next image and in the upper left hand corner this is a, a shot taken in 1890. This is a glacier in the Rocky Mountains. It's the Bow River Glacier and this feeds the city of Calgary um, with its drinking water supply. Note in the image directly below taken in 2010 
the same tree is evident in the lower image as in the upper image, although it's actually fallen over quite a bit more, that glacier has virtually disappeared. And we're witnessing this rapid loss of meltwater from glaciers throughout the entire Rocky Mountains and in other places uh, around the planet. What this means for cities is that their long-term um, security in terms of their drinking water is increasingly at risk. On the right-hand side are two images, the one in the lower right of drought conditions in California leading to very sub substantial uh, grass and forest fires. And once again, we're seeing that um, again in 2014, probably worse than what we saw in 2006 and 2007. And in the upper right-hand quadrant is the um, destruction that was um, brought ashore by Hurricane Sandy uh, on the east coast of the United States. And if we go back to the early NASA programs, um, Houston, you have a problem. Uh, that is, we on the planet have a problem. We have profoundly mismanaged the basic global infrastructure, that is the natural capital, upon which all of our um, species uh, is dependent. So if we think about the challenges that we're facing in the 21st century, as an ecologist, I would argue that they really are um, summed up in a, essentially an an iconic or an, a mathematical algorithm. It's water plus energy plus natural capital equals adaptation to a changing climate plus nutritional self-sufficiency. So we need to balance the needs that we take from the landscape, water, energy, and the benefits from natural capital with um, the challenge that we're facing in terms of a changing climate, not climate change, just reverse the words. It's a changing climate and food production. As Dendra pointed out earlier, much of our current perspective in terms of municipal infrastructure dates back to 25, 2700 years ago when the Romans literally gave rise to um, an infrastructure model of resources in and wastes out. And that has literally become translated in the 20th century, late 1800s to the 20th and 21st centuries, to the solution to pollution is dilution. In 1905, Albert Einstein, in one of his um, three fundamentally world-changing publications, observed problems cannot be solved at the same level of awareness that created them. To rephrase Professor Einstein, the same kind of thinking that gave rise to the problem cannot be used to find its solution. In other words, by taking a framework, a way of looking at the world, a perspective, we frame questions and then we seek answers from within that same framework. What Einstein pointed out is, is that many of the questions we ask from within a framework have no known solution within that framework. The irony is the question doesn't actually exist. It's an artifact of the way that we framed the world view and from within which we were asking questions. Excuse me. If we change the framework, we fundamentally change the nature of the questions we ask and what we discover is many of the questions which earlier seemed insolvable no longer need to be solved because the questions no longer exist. So rather than spend a ton of time and energy and resources trying to solve or fix a problem that probably is not literally resolvable, if we spend a small amount of our energy to change our framework, we can literally raise a completely different set of questions. And most of the questions we asked earlier no longer need to be resolved because they were an artifact of the way we used to look at the world. An example of this, of course, is our Western approach of using drinking water in large city centralized water supply systems for everything. In other words, we use drinking water to flush our toilets. So if what we had was bottled water, would we go out and spend the money on bottled water to meet drinking water standards um, in order to flush our toilets? 
and I've borrowed this slide from Ed Clerico of Natural Systems Utilities in New Jersey, and the obvious answer is, when shown as in this image, the very concept is ridiculous, and yet that's the same fundamental tenant that the Romans used because they only had one option, and that was to bring water into their cities using gravity, and they did not have a way to purify the wastewater that they produced within their cities. So it was literally the only model they had, which was a linear model. It was open-ended, resources in, and wastes out, as typified by our standard toilet system. So if we're going to address the issues in terms of environmental or ecological transformation, we simply need to change one perspective. And my colleague Ed Clerico in this slide points out that we, we literally account for, in terms of our, uh, in the American uh, economy, this is equally true for almost any developed country, about 1,200 gallons per day per capita. So we don't use that all in our house, but that includes agricultural water, industrial water, but less than one gallon per capita is actually consumed. What that means is we don't need to use drinking water for everything. And so the question is, can we completely rethink that open linear model that uh, the Romans gave us um, as a legacy, and if so, what might that model look like? Of course, in the modern world, as I pointed out earlier, it's water plus energy, and in this diagram, we're simply looking at the amounts of energy typically consumed by an economy based on different types of uh, energy sources. So in the 1850s to the early or late 1800s, we had steam engines, we began to see the introduction of electric motors, gasoline engines, nuclear energy in the 1970s, and of course, increasingly, we're reliant upon coal, natural gas, fossil fuels, a much smaller amount of hydroelectric power, and the worldwide net, the internet, is consuming an amount of energy which is doubling now, I believe it's every year, in order to drive global communication systems. And again, these next few slides are just intended to show how and where the energy is and how it's being used in different parts of the world. So the image on the top lays out um, under uh, over just under 200 years, the manner in which we obtained energy and where that energy came from. Biofuels, wood, grass, dung, the introduction of um, commercial quantities, industrial quantities of coal, oil beginning in the 1920s, then the development of natural gas in the 1950s, hydroelectric power from roughly the 1960s on, and then of course nuclear energy um, from about 1970 or 80 on. And the image on the bottom just shows what the total share of world energy consumption is between the developed world and the developing world. So the industrialized world is a fairly um, linear and rising estimate of energy that's required but look at the developing world in green. The amount of energy needed for modern cities and industrial economies in the developing world or in the third world is going to go up dramatically. And we've already seen in the last five years that the amount of air pollution produced by China now exceeds that of the United States. If we look at total world energy consumption, and this is already almost five years old, fossil fuels dominate and have dominated um, our energy supply. Renewables and nuclear make up the rest. And the question that I think is being asked virtually everywhere is, can we look at renewables in terms of wind or um, biodiesel, geothermal, solar, 
as well as reuse, capturing energy that we've already paid for that we typically dispose of. And that is one of the great challenges of the 21st century. Um, and it's not because we don't know how to do it technologically. It's primarily a financial issue of competing energy costs in an open marketplace and the ability to move this energy around within existing grid systems, many of which are already overdue for substantial retrofits. Um, I'm being told that there's insufficient data for an image here. This is um, um, a PDF. But essentially, the image, um, if it was fully explored, would simply point out the dysfunctional energy supply chain from the fuel to the service. So in the upper left-hand corner is a pump jack pulling bulk crude out of the ground. And somewhere in the lower right-hand image is a cup of coffee. And essentially, the amount of or the percent of energy taken out of the ground that is then actually ending up in the coffee is between 5 and 10 percent. In other words, a vast amount of the energy that we produce is lost through very inefficient uh, transmission systems. Of course, one of the most important principles that we've come to understand is producing energy costs energy. And so what we really need to be focused on is what the actual return on our investment is if we look at the amount of energy produced. So this diagram, which I've borrowed from Tad Homer Dixon at the University of Toronto, simply points out the amount of energy that is required to be invested and the amount of energy that you get back. And so from domestic oil production in the 1930s, for every barrel of oil that you expended to get energy out of the ground, you got 100 barrels back. What we're seeing is today that's probably been reduced to about 10 barrels to one. Um, the fracking industry and our ability to go after uh, oil reserves and natural gas reserves that historically were unavailable will probably increase that um, return on investment to maybe 20 to one but we're not going to get back to 100 to 1. Nuclear, photovoltaic, wind, hydro, natural gas, all have relatively high cost in terms of investing in the infrastructure to get the energy out. Of course, power density is also extremely important. And this is a simple term used to describe the amount of high quality and very substantial energy that's needed to per, uh, perform a certain task. So this example, again, borrowed from Tad Homer Dixon, simply, and Vaclav Smeal from the University of Manitoba, point out that supermarkets, high-rise buildings, steel, steel mills and refineries, industry and cities, all have very high demands for um, high value and um, high power density, that is a large amount of wattage. Photovoltaics, wind and phytobiomass energy production does not a kind of energy density, the amount of bulk high demand energy that is needed to drive our cities. So the idea that photovoltaics or wind is going to replace the traditional amounts or traditional sources of energy is probably not true. We're going to be looking at a mix of energy sources in the future. One of the other issues that the world is beginning to grasp and grapple with is, as most people now live in cities, that means their nutrition is produced by um, large farms, and those farms and high, en or high food production is largely driven by the use of fertilizers, nitrogen and phosphorus. If we actually look at the amount of available phosphorus in the world to drive modern agriculture, we're, I think, shocked to discover a couple of things. The first is this image, which is taken in the Western Sahara, used to be a verdant, extremely productive landscape that largely fed the city of Rome it's now a desert. It has literally been mined to death. If we look at where 
the um, total amount of phosphorus that is currently mined from phosphate rock and that drives agriculture globally, Morocco, China, South Africa, Jordan, and Russia hold 95% or more of the identified high quality economically recoverable phosphate rock on the planet. The United States and Canada have very, very small quantities and most of what we need we import. What that means is that a resource as important as water for food production is actually in the hands and in the control of other countries. So the third challenge of the 21st century that is maintaining a clean, safe, continuous supply of water, abundant and certainly economically um, feasibly acceptable energy and nutrients for agriculture and that is to recover the phosphate that we've already used and some of that is from animal and human man, uh, manure or wastes. If we think about this in the context of production facilities, there are 7 billion people but 70 billion cows. So we need to find a manner, a mechanism to close the loop on energy recovery. Lest any of us think that this is just an academic exercise, um, these are some figures that we've taken from a range of government sources over the last two years with a two degree rise in global temperature, that is temperature over India, there will be a 25 percent loss of food production. China will lose almost a third of its food capacity. Iraq and Syria have already lost a third of their grain production since 2003. Texas much the same since 1975 and that rate is accelerating both as a result of a changing climate and precipitation patterns but also because water from deep groundwater wells is being used to frack um, deep injection wells to produce more natural gas and oil thereby depriving uh, communities from using that water for human consumption or agriculture and Kansas has lost about 30 percent uh, in the last four or five years. So the question that we would ask is can we fix this image that was a compilation of images taken from NASA um, and each one of these white elements is um, a city and a town and we're going to add 900 new large dots in the next 30 years. My, su my suggestion is we don't have a choice. We actually have to find a way to fix this. I would argue that the way to do that is we need a cultural change. We need to shift from this open linear model to a closed loop system design. And in order to do that, we need again to move from a linear to an integrated system model that is essentially based on the model that nature uses which is a closed loop completely recoverable model for all resources. We need to integrate ecology, social equity with the economy. This is literally about finding a more profitable way to do something differently. So the model on the right, the diagram on the right, simply shows a degenerative model for design and planning moving up into a restorative uh, and regenerative model. And you'll note that as you move from degenerative up through sustainable to restorative to regenerative, what you end up with are many more benefits. And in the second session, uh, in a series of case studies, I'm going to show it actually turns out to be more profitable but we do need to think about the economics of these activities quite differently. In other words, we need to achieve much higher degrees of self-sustainability or self-sustaining um, design using less of the natural resource, resource, the stuff coming in from the left and recovering what used to be considered to be wastes. And again, this is simply another example of a degenerative system which is a positive feedback loop and is inherently self-destructive versus a regenerative system that is a negative feedback loop and that is a loop that dampens the 
magnitude of differences when a change occurs. This image simply lays out within three city blocks three examples of stormwater and rainwater management. So the model on the left is conventional engineering. It's what the Romans built 2,500, 2,700 years ago. We have literally millions of miles of this all over the world. Beginning in 1970, we saw a change to environmental engineering. The noun is engineering, and the adjective, the modifier, is environmental. This is typically the greening up of our fairly traditional design uh, and planning uh, infrastructure. The one on the right is engineered ecology, and it's all based on resource recovery. So there we've simply reversed the noun and the adjective. It's not greening up an engineering design, it's literally engineering uh, with an ecological model. The question that I would ask each of you is, so which one do you want to live beside? The one on the left or the one on the right? And we will come back to the one on the right in the second session. This is one half of one of my graduate students' master's theses, and this is um, a, a rainwater management capture system uh, that led to regenerating a complex of wetlands and streams and the return of the salmon into a, a dense urban core. So essentially what we're looking at doing is balancing the need for development through a process of integrated resource management on the microscopic portion of the planet. So if we think of that fish as being macroscopic, the total amount of macroscopic biomass, biomass that we can see with the unaided eye, everything from fish to whales to people to cows to chickens, all of that total biomass is less than the total biomass of the microbes, of the things that we need a microscope to see. And it's the microscopic ecology of the planet that we have profoundly mismanaged. And that is largely what the group that I represent is looking at doing is to reach of these, this microbial ecology in order to generate a great many benefits that we are currently not able to receive. Pretty standard image of the hydrological cycle. We've seen this for about 200 years. This was worked out by a French scientist in the late 1700s. And it's a closed loop system. And I draw your attention to the little red box at the estuary of the river. The model is wrong, but it's terribly incomplete. The model that I just showed you is the, the large macroscopic portion of the hydrological cycle, the blue water cycle we call this, and it accounts for about 35% of the movement of water, fresh water, on the planet. The part we almost never see and virtually never include in any of our thinking is the green water cycle. This is, accounts for about two-thirds of the movement of water on the terrestrial portion of the planet, and it is largely associated with water uh, in the shallow soils on our landscapes. So when we change the nature of our landscapes from wildland systems with little or no human activity on it, as we begin to denude these landscapes, we see very important changes in the route and the fate and transport that water takes as it flows across the landscape. Under natural conditions, this is a model of capture, store, beneficial use. Nature uses a myriad of methods to capture water and store it on the land or in the vegetation for the benefit of the creatures that live there. What we have spent 6,000 years learning to do as humans is to get water off the land as fast as possible in order to get our crops in the ground and to prevent our cities from being flooded. The challenge is that this disrupted water cycle has led to a myriad of problems. Increased runoff, drought, pollution downstream in the receiving waters, increasing water scarcity, increasing global thermal temperatures, and I'll come back to that in the very last session. And of course, this process has been accelerated in the 20th century as we've moved from one to seven billion people in urban environments 
and we're going to add another two billion to those same environments over the next 40 or to, uh, 20 or 30 years. And as I mentioned earlier, this has led to droughts, to all kinds of flooding, all of which have profound implications for agricultural, industrial uh, production and for our cities. And of course, this is entirely based on a very simple faulty assumption, and that is we can continue to build these open linear systems and we are not at any level really and truly required to rethink our municipal infrastructure where we recover virtually all of the resources that we brought into the city in the first place. The World Business Council of, uh, for Sustainable Development has argued that perhaps the single most important question in the 21st century is can we value ecosystem services in a free market economy? Can we put a hard financial value to what it is a tree does in terms of benefiting the landscapes that uh, we coexist in? I won't go into this in detail, but this is essentially a dynamic balance sheet uh, for water. Again, I borrowed this from Ed Clerico at Natural Systems Utilities in New Jersey. And this is a diagram that we use to walk the public through how water moves through the landscapes they live in. And we can move from left to right in an open linear model, or we can actually close the loop and recover virtually all of the water. Uh, that we bring into the city as long as we engage in a fit for purpose model uh, of use. That is, you tell me what you want to use the water for and I will tell you what quality that you can use and where you can source that from. As the quality of water that we use increases up to and including the use of safe clean drinking water, the cost of producing that has typically gone up dramatically. When we start using waters of very different qualities for different uses, what we discover is that cost is far more uh, reasonable because we're only having to spend a lot of money to produce a small amount of drinking water rather than you spending an enormous amount of money to use, uh, produce drinking water for the use in everything. Another aspect of the changing landscapes is this notion of sens sensible versus latent heat. As we denude the landscapes of the vegetation, what we discover is we literally radiate out a great deal of heat back up into the atmosphere. Heat that did not exist when most of the planet was covered in vegetation of one form or another. And it's understanding how to re-green, especially our cities, that we can dramatically reduce the amount of heat that is being redirected or radiating back up into the atmosphere. If you plot the thermal profile of a city, you can see up to a six or 10 degree difference uh, in terms of Fahrenheit um, between the downtown concrete cores where there's virtually no vegetation and the rural areas uh, where there's a lot less um, uh, paves and reflective surfaces. If we look at this globally, what we discovered was that last year in 2013, July was the hottest month on record in the United States and 2014 um, is already um, well on its way to being the hottest year uh, in terms of recorded temperatures um, over the last hundred plus years. What we're finding is that this is true all over the planet. If it's dry, it tends to be hot. So as we reduce the amount of water, moisture, and vapor uh, in and around our cities, the temperatures go up dramatically with needs for air conditioning and a lot of um, other energy consumption, uh, consumptive uses to make the cities literally uh, livable. Um, Houston, Texas is a city that relies very heavily on air conditioning um, in order to make it uh, a, a livable uh, and a city that it's a, it's a pleasure to work in. So drought begets drought and drought actually causes heat waves. So much of what we're seeing on the planet is I would argue perhaps only partly due to the use of uh, fossil fuels and the discharge of increased CO2 into the atmosphere um, and I will come back to this in the in the third session
there is mounting evidence, mounting scientific e evidence that it's the loss of wetlands and riparian zones and the loss of this moisture in the first 300 feet that may also be driving global temperatures uh, to go up substantially. Again, this is an image of the Bow River Glacier that I showed you earlier. Just keep an eye on that uh, dead tree. And there's the same tree. And what we're seeing, of course, is a substantial reduction in the amount of water coming off the Rocky Mountains, which means groundwater levels are dropping. Um, a report that came out in the Journal of Science about a month ago indicated that California, the state of California, has lost 67 trillion liters of water as a result of changes in precipitation patterns and loss of groundwater and surface water. That's enough mass no longer present on the landscape to have caused some of the mountain chains, the mountain um, ranges to have risen perhaps as much as half an inch. In other words, a geological scale event. If we think about world energy consumption, this diagram um, which I've borrowed from Carl, um, lays out the approximate known resources for natural gas. This is the total amount of natural gas um, that was believed to be available um, about five or six years ago. Uh, oil reserves, a substantial body of coal, uranium, and the amount of energy that is consumed by the world in one year is that small box uh, in the center of the larger box. If we look at the amount of evapotranspiration, that is the amount of solar energy irradiated during one year onto the surface of the planet, which historically was intercepted by living biomass, it dwarfs the total known energy reserves uh, that we've identified on the planet. And this is an energy flux that we simply don't include in most of our calculations on uh, global climate change or on the way that we energize our cities. So from an ecological perspective, it really is about keeping water on the land longer. Nature's fundamental design mode on the terrestrial portion of the planet is capture, store, beneficial use. And the bottom diagram, uh, the large image is a headland watershed in the rock. Rocky Mountain to BC with his drinking water. And the wetland in the upper left is just a close up view of one of these uh, wetland ponds in this high alpine um, wild natural system. And the wetland on the right is one that we built to address rainwater runoff uh, from a, uh, about a 70 house subdivision uh, in the city of Victoria. And they both function the same and the image in the upper right was taken during a 100-year storm event that uh, hit this uh, part of the um, a province in 2003 and within a couple of days you'd have there was no visible evidence that that system that wetland had suffered any uh, significant harm as the, a result of the amount of water coming in. So we're essentially looking at the net zero approach. The R complex, if you will, from recognize to remember the laws of physics and nature, looking for renewable um, derivatives for energy and water, looking ultimately at using all forms of development to regenerate the landscape function, that is the health of the landscape from which those resources are being extracted, and of course full cost accounting, that is trying to understand the full cost all of the externalities, but also the full cost of a specific type of design. So can we contrast the full cost of the Roman model for municipal infrastructure versus what a, a closed loop design might look like and what it might cost, and more importantly, whether or not it actually generates revenues from the um, renewable um, resources that have been recovered. And I will go into that uh, in the third session. Essentially, we're arguing that the landscape of the 21st century needs to take an integrated resource management profile from our reservoirs to our homes, to our factories, to the ocean, 
we need at every step to understand how we can recover a resource that we've already used once and that we've paid for and that we can pay a lot less or that will actually generate revenues if we reuse it again. The key in all of this type of thinking in terms of a closed loop system is the capacity to scale up. And in the next session, I'm going to walk you through individual sites where we look at single family dwellings, small farms, to larger scale agriculture, to neighborhood developments, to city scale, and then ultimately to the kind of education programs that we need to be thinking about. I would argue that the type of education program that we currently have globally, both from K to 12 through the college and university and research facilities, is still largely based on a fragmented, disintegrated approach. I know my colleagues in many of the academic institutes will take umbrage at that statement, but I believe it's actually true. And certainly, many of our younger students, our young graduate students and undergraduates and college students are telling us they are still receiving largely a fragmented, disintegrated um, knowledge package or complex of packages in our institutions and there isn't an opportunity to understand how to integrate all of these different knowledge bases. And I would suggest that until we can do that and our education systems change, we aren't going to be able to scale up um, in a timely fashion. So I will leave this session uh, with this image of uh, scalability and I will look forward to speaking to you in the next session uh, where we examine a series of case studies on taking these kinds of concepts and actually putting them into practice and then tracking them um, for now over 20 years to see how they've evolved and what the financial profiles of those projects were. I will leave it at that. Thank you so much, Patrick. Um, I, I can't thank you enough for the examples and I really look forward to your next presentation. And for those of you who are watching live, we are running about 10 minutes, uh, I think it's about 10 minutes long, but we will be uh, moving on to actually the next session at about 3.15. And with that, I'm going to close the meeting and um, see you all at the next session. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick.